Okay, um, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, personally Ajay, uh, uh, the Bharat Krishak Samaj, for inviting me. Um, terrific that Shekhar, you're here to uh, moderate this because I think uh, many of these things, uh, many of you probably know much more than than I do. I, I have to say that uh, you know I'm not an expert on agriculture, as you, as, I mean. Um, and really, um, I owe. I have to begin with with a kind of mia culpa uh, in this. You know, when we wrote the first uh, economic survey, we um, you know wrote about you know industry and services and manufacturing, and actually we did very. You know, we had one chapter on on the APMCs, but not very much on agriculture. And then, when we went around presenting it uh, in places, you know, we did get the feedback. Uh, from a lot of people that you know we hadn't uh, uh, focused our attention on agriculture, and uh, and that was I think a very fair criticism, um, especially since I think uh, we know uh, Ajay mentioned what's going on. You know we've had four successive seasons of below average rainfall, and uh, you know international prices have crashed, so uh, farm incomes have been under a lot of stress. So I think uh, we were remiss in the first economic survey in, in not devoting enough time. But I, I hope we've made some amends, at least. The second survey, which came out, uh, we have uh, quite a bit on, on agriculture. So, um, uh, so, so mea um, culpa to begin with. The second thing is that I have to say that, you know, in my uh, 18 months here, you know, my uh, ground knowledge of, you know, serious knowledge of agriculture in India was, was somewhat limited. But I, I've really learned so much uh, talking to people like uh, Ajay, my, my guru, Harish Damodaran, is sitting here. You know, uh, I learned so much reading his columns. Devesh Roy, uh, uh, Ramesh Chand, Ashok Gulati, my colleague Rohit Parmar, you know, lots of people. So, so, so I'm not an expert. I'm not going to say things that are terribly new. Uh, I just want to you know, step back and take a kind of distant, slightly academic perspective on this. And uh, I hope to you know, uh, a, provoke more questions than provide answers. Uh, and I hope not to make any gaffes here uh, as a chief economic advisor. So, so uh, with that, let me begin. Um, I, I think when, whenever we talk about a a agriculture, um, I think the first question we ask is, you know, why, why agriculture? I mean, to many of you it may be self-evident, but, you know, I really had to think a little bit about why. I, I think there are two broad reasons why agriculture is so important in India what I would call intrinsic reasons and instrumental reasons. I mean, the intrinsic reasons, I think all of you know, 49% of India's workforce is in agriculture, gets its livelihood from agriculture. And uh, about, depending on how you, whether you're talking about agriculture or rural sector, uh, somewhere between 40 to 50% of households uh, derive their sustenance from, from agriculture. So it really is a big deal. Uh, uh, um, and similarly, 80, about 80 to 82% of India's poor are, are in agriculture or rural sector, which we want to do about it. And then, of course, agriculture provides food security, which I think is really important. So I, I think so. Uh, bottom line, you know, th th these numbers are so stark and so important and so big that we can't afford to neglect agriculture. But there is also an instrumental reason. I, ag so agriculture as a kind of uh, vehicle or a means to some other end. Uh, I, I think that you know, agriculture does also have the power to hold back uh, uh, the economy as a whole. So that's another reason for, you know, I think, why we should focus our attention on agriculture. Um, for example, you know, uh, in India, we know that inflation is affected by agriculture. We've, we're discovering that you know, even in these last few months or last year, when international prices have come down, inflation has come down. What is keeping inflation high is, in fact, agriculture. You know? Uh, uh, agricultural, uh, both the wholesale and the CPI are weighted heavily with agriculture and, and food, uh, and that is affecting. And in and that, you know, via direct and indirect channels affects growth. You know, interest rates could be uh, would be lower had inflation been lower and agricultural inflation been lower, which would have affected the economy. So that's one way. I think the other way, very important way in which agriculture affects the rest of the economy, is that what we do in agriculture. You know, for example, just to give you an example. Uh, power pricing in, in agriculture, you know, um, and I'm not going to take a view on whether it's good or bad. We'll talk about that later. But we know that that affects the price of power for manufacturing. Um, similarly, credit we provide to agriculture 
affects the rest of the economy. So, so you know, so it's very, so agriculture has a very important effect on that. The other, I think, important way is that I think agriculture, the fortunes of agriculture are going to determine the quality of urbanization that we're going to have uh, in India. You know, whether we're going to have good urbanization or bad urbanization will be determined a lot by what kind of labor migrates out of agriculture. Educated, you know, able to do relatively high skill jobs. Uh, I, I think that's one very important. Uh, and of course, agriculture can be a source of social stress. I mean, and you know, in many, many ways, we've seen uh, what's happened in the last couple of years. Uh, and so, um, so unless we take agriculture very seriously, I think uh, we're in for a, for a lot of trouble for the economy. And I think um, uh, it, it's in some ways, uh, it may not. I mean, th all this attention on agriculture that we see. Um, has been determined by this, these proximate factors that Ajay pointed out. But in some ways, I think we need to be mindful of agriculture, even regardless of what's happening in the short run for, for all these reasons. OK, so why agriculture? Now, for me, it was also very interesting that you know we think of agriculture, especially in these times, in somewhat kind of, uh, from somewhat kind of gloomy perspective. But I think it's worth stepping back and understanding that the story of Indian agriculture is not a story of failure. It's a story of many successes. And, and I want to you know, outline some of them, some of which you know, I discovered, again, uh, uh, in the last 18 months. You know, Green Revolution, of course. I mean, imagine the days of droughts in the 60s, the, the dependence on, on foreign uh, imports of food and what that did to us. And then, of course, the Green Revolution changed all that. So in some ways, we're in a very different situation uh, in agriculture from where we used to be. Similarly, we had the White Revolution. And, and I have to, uh, uh, as an aside, uh, you know, highlight this to some extent because you know, uh, uh, Raghu and I have written a series of papers saying why foreign aid has actually been not been very good for developing countries as a whole. Uh, and generally, especially, uh, uh, aid in the form of cheap food uh, has very detrimental impacts all over the world, especially in Africa. And in some ways, the white revolution experience was a, a real, you know, kind of repudiated that general rule uh, where, in fact, these cheap food import milk powder was, in fact, used to develop the indigenous uh, food sector. And of course, the rest is history. Uh, and uh, so, so that's really a very interesting uh, uh, success uh, in a way that confounds the general international pattern on this. Then, of course, we had uh, you know, seven, six, seven years of the commodity price boom induced dynamism. You know, we know that uh, you know, uh, in some ways, agriculture had it pr relatively good because of high international prices uh, uh, from about 2007 onwards. Um, I think what is less well understood is that I think there's been a real spread in the geography and composition of agricultural dynamism. I mean, remember, the Green Revolution was Punjab, Haryana, and, and some of the southern states. But in the last, I think I would say, 10 to 15 years, that has spread you know, geographically. Um, Gujarat, Maharashtra, West Bengal, Madhya Pradesh now, to some extent Bihar. And so, so that geographical spread is actually a, a very welcome development. And also, there's been a spread in terms of, you know, we not just do cereals, but you know, Gujarat is a, is a cotton success story. Maharashtra is a horticulture story. West Bengal is a potato story. Bihar is a maize story. And of course, but of course, Madhya Pradesh is more the conventional cereal story. So, but there has been this, this spread, uh, uh, which in some ways, I think, has been really very important. And the last point, I think, um, it's something that you know uh, this drought has brought home, is that our agriculture has, in fact, become much more resilient. Uh, I, I'm going to give you one of these uh, probably incomprehensible economist charts to explain this. Um, so this plots, you know, what happens. It's the correlation between rainfall and 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 food production, and you see the 2015 dot. It's actually given how little rainfall we had, and that it was a second season, a, a second year, under normal conditions, we'd, it should have been food and agricultural production. That 15 dot should have been much lower, but actually, you know, we're going to get about flat or zero, a little bit positive growth, which I think 10, 15 years ago may not have happened. So I think it's worth acknowledging that basic uh, uh, success story as well. 
But then we move on then obviously to the challenges. And in some ways, I think there are just, I mean, conceptually to think about agriculture, just two things, two big objectives that we need to think. How do you raise farm incomes and livelihoods? It's all a matter of increasing agricultural productivity. There, uh, I, I want to tell you a story before I, I uh, uh, well, maybe I'll show you the chart first. Th this is a chart of overall agricultural productivity. And you see India is barely visible. This is value added per worker compared to China, Brazil, Europe, and the United States. You know, uh, and I, th I think the numbers are quite staggering. For example, you know, China is 3.7 times more productive, Brazil 7 times, Europe 52 times, and the US almost 100 times more productive. So th that is you know, the, the distance we have to cover if agriculture really has to be a source of uh, you know, uh, real f increasing farmer livelihoods. But I think I want to uh, all of you to hold this paradoxical thought uh, in your heads that we have to simultaneously work on improving agricultural productivity, but at the same time, I think people have to move out of agriculture into other sectors. The story of development all over the world is a story of going away from agriculture into much higher productive activities. This is not to denigrate you know, the value and contribution of agriculture, but it is to recognize the pattern that there are some inherent limitations to agriculture in the long run. And you know, while we want to, you know, so if you want people to become you know, really richer and, and have, they have to move into high productive activities. And therefore, while we have to work to boost agricultural productivity, people have to, you know, en masse move out of agriculture, but under good conditions, not being forced out because of low productivity in agriculture. So uh, just to give you a, a, a s small personal story, I was in uh, uh, Krishna district of Andhra Pradesh on Saturday. And I mean, what's happening there in terms of the, the DBT and the jam revolution is just amazing. I, I do think that uh, that uh, Krishna district is the cutting edge internationally of what we can do to bring together, you know, what we call the jam, you know, financial inclusion, biometrics, and mobile, bringing it all together to help the poor. So at the end of the visit, I turned to the collector and said, you know, uh, it's, uh, I, was, uh, I mean, very impressed. What is the per capita GDP of Krishna district? And he said it was 1.1 lakh rupees, it is actually very low. Even for something, it's something like $1,500 or a little bit less, which you know is actually very well. So even a, a kind of fertile place like Krishna district, very well run, average uh, you know, uh, uh, incomes are low because it's mostly reliant on agriculture. So it's a kind of thought that you, know, uh, you get rich by moving out of agriculture, Ajay Jhakar apart, of course, and you know, uh, uh, or Shekhar Gupta apart with their uh, fancy farms. Uh, but but generally, for the uh, common man, you know, you have to, you know, it, it's a, it has to be a transition. I think Mao famously said, you know, the, the way out of agriculture is industry. But for India, that might be something else. But I mean, the point is, the way out is, is you, I mean, agriculture cannot be a permanent source of livelihood for a large um, swathe of the population. I think the second major objective is intrinsically agriculture is volatile. So we have to protect farmers against volatility and risk. And here, let me show you a chart that I was actually quite surprised by. This compares agricultural growth in India and China. See, look to the left of this circle. India and China look very similar in terms of volatility, up and down, up and down, highly volatile. But notice what happens in the last 10, 15 years. The blue line is smooth. That's China. They've basically smoothed out volatility, but the Indian thing is still very jagged. A and so in some ways, therefore, we have our work cut out a lot, uh, you know, not just to boost productivity, but also to cushion farmers against the downside uh, uh, in India. And that's why I think the, you know, what the government is doing in terms of the Fasil Bhima Yojana and, and related is actually terribly important on that. Now, having said that the two objectives are um, productivity and, and risk, the point is that this ha these objectives have to be attained against the backdrop of what I call the ghost of Malthus. I think there is no question that basic agricultural resources, water, land, soil quality, atmosphere, 
are going to become, are becoming scarcer and scarcer. No question. It's partly because of climate change and, and, and what is happening to weather around the world. It's partly self-inflicted. I think our domestic policies have led to a situation where some of these things are becoming, you know, depleted. You know, soil quality depleted for obvious reasons. Water tables going down, again, for obvious reasons. So, so I think it's happening against a, a, a context that is, is very different today than it may have been, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Now, so the question is, okay, uh, why <coughs> agriculture is very important? You know, we've had successes, but we face challenges. And against this, you know, I think an uh, environment that's going to become much more difficult. So the question is, what needs to be done? Now, sure, I'm going to uh, not stick my neck out because I can guarantee you that in this crowd, if I were to poll you and ask you what needs to be done to in improve agricultural productivity and reduce risk, uh, Ajay's answer will be different from Harish's answer, will be different from Shekhar's answer, and all of you will be right. You know, there are so many things that need to be done in agriculture. It's not funny what all we need to do. Uh, so I am not going to spend a whole lot of time telling you uh, or trying to resolve this. I'm just going to run through them very quickly because I want to pose a more fundamental and deeper question to which I think you will have much better answers than I will. And okay, let me let me run through the list of things. We all know uh, what we need to do. You know, I think we need to move. See, remember the Green Revolution and even the the 2007 boom in agriculture relied on getting more from more. You put in more fertilizer, you put in more water, you put in more power, you get more output. But now, because of this changing environment, it has to be more from less. We have to rationalize our input use, and you know whether it's power, whether it's fertilizer, whether it's land, I think we know what needs to be done. Then, of course, we need to create one market in, 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 in agriculture, and I think the NAM that the government is working on is moving in that direction. We need to build agricultural infrastructure and reduce the role of middlemen. Uh, we need to strengthen crop and farm insurance. And of course, you know, if you think about land usage in India, we do have fairly small holdings of land which come in the way of raising agricultural productivity. So how do we encourage uh, you know, land consolidation? And Niti Aayog is now going to put out a model law on, on land leasing and other things. But you know, land also has to be worked on to improve agricultural productivity. We know we need to increase the role for science. Uh, we know that you know, domestic R&D capability has to be improved. We know that we had a green revolution, and now we need a rainbow revolution in pulses. We know, and this is a point that uh, Ajay uh, uh, has made just now, and, and uh, uh, Harish kind of talks about it quite often in his columns, that there's a lot of policy uncertainty. You know, when farm prices, when international prices are high, uh, we, uh, we adopt one set of policies. When farm prices are low, we adopt another set of policies. And in the end, we end up hurting farmers in the long run because they're subject to this policy uncertainty. So they don't know, you know how to base their long-term decisions. You know, should you base it at an onion MEP of 100, an onion MP MEP of 300, or an onion MEP of 400, or no MEP at all? So it's a lot of... Uh, then, of course, there are lots of people who will say that, you know, and, and the Shanta Kumar Committee report also said this, that we need to strengthen the institutions, you know. FCI, we all know what needs to be done. On the other hand, we also have ICAR, and many people have views on that. And, and then, of course, we also need to, you know, rationalize agricultural credit. And by the way, I'm sure this list is not exhaustive. I'm sure I missed out things that many of you know. You know, on this agricultural credit, I will just say, point you all to a study by Ram Kumar and Chavan, which came out. And it's really quite interesting that, you know, we talk about agricultural credit, but, you know, is it too much? Is it really going to agriculture? Is it going to small farmers? Is it going for capital as opposed to short term? Uh, these are all, you know, very important questions, and these are not, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of scope for improvement on this. So, you know, so I, I can keep adding to the list, and I, w I don't think I will illuminate any of you any form. So I want to ask the kind of, you know, kind of the meta question um, I want to pose to all of you. You know, no sooner do I say that, or when someone says, 
oh, we must have better water conservation. Uh, oh, we must improve, uh, you know, policy uncertainty. To me, the obvious question is, well, why hasn't it happened already? And, and the deeper question, I think, that Shekhar also will, you will have much better feel for, why isn't good agricultural policy good state-level politics? I think that's, I think, the deeper question we have to ask. I mean, we know, for example, if you look at agricultural growth and what's happened in the electoral politics of Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, West Bengal, you know, there has been some correlation between the fact that you know, many of these governments got re-elected uh, in, in part because agriculture did very well. Um, so, so there is something interesting happening in India in terms of you know, making good agricultural policy, good politics, but why, is it hap why isn't it happening more widely? I mean, these are, I'm, I'm sure they're very simple-minded questions. Why does it not pay you in the polls to avoid droughts, given that so many farmers are going to be affected? The numbers in agriculture are so big that at some level it must be good politics if you actually cater to the needs, you know, the wants, you know, the basic material well-being of, you know, millions and millions of farmers. So that's, for me, the bigger puzzle, you know. Again, when you say, why isn't there more investment in water conservation? Why is it so difficult to phase out APMCs when we know that the benefits will accrue to lots of farmers? We know it's, you know, it's a few against the many, and in electoral politics, democratic politics, the many should win out. I know you also will have answers, and I'm sure there are good answers, but I think these are the, the other thing. Why can't the demonstrable success of BT cotton in Gujarat be extended? You know, uh, we know where the opposition is coming from, but, you know, this is a demonstrably successful model. Why can't we extend this? And, you know, I could keep asking question after question, you know, why is there still a fear of the private sector despite the many successes which were really private sector driven, maize, BT cotton, pearl millet, or, or bajra. And, and I think we still are hesitant about embracing markets in agriculture. And, and, and so, you know, that's a, the other thing which, you know, it's, it's kind of, again, a, a, a very obvious point. We did, you know, my team did some work on fertilizer. And, and if you think about it, you know, fertilizer policy in India, we, sh we said this in the economic survey, actually ends up hurting the small farmers because there are black markets uh, in fertilizer, which actually impact much more on small f farmers than big farmers. The same thing is true with seeds. So again, why is it that if there are many, many more small farmers and very few big farmers, why isn't politics kind of uh, rearrange itself to make these things advantageous? So I think these are the, you know, I think the bigger questions, I think, for us to ponder over, you know, before we recommend solutions, you know, we say, you know, that's why I open the newspapers and, you know, uh, every day there are, you know, no, no uh, dearth of, you know, advice in terms of what needs to be done in agriculture. But I think, um, you know, how this can be, you know, part of electoral politics is, I think, the, the deeper question that, you know, I'd love all of us to, to discuss. I'm, I'm almost finished. I'm going to... So here's, here's a kind of a, just a stepping back and, and, and a kind of a, 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 a bigger what, what can be done. You know, if you think about it that, you know, there's so much uh, government intervention in agriculture, do just do the following thought experiment. What if... You know, the government just did two basic things in, in agriculture. One, big public investments like, you know, the, the Gram Sadak Yojana, the R&D, the extension, you know, providing truly public goods. Public goods, by the way, which, you know, if you think about the Green Revolution, it was the agricultural extension services as much as the technology that contributed to the Green Revolution, and yet we know now what the state of extension services in India is. So maybe the government should focus on, you know, just providing a lot of public goods, public investment, one. And second, I think we have to be realistic, at least for some period, that there will be a huge part of Indian farming that may not provide enough livelihood to people. So I think maybe we should be thinking about also, this is, you know, providing some basic income support to, you know, you, I mean, I don't want to draw the line how many farmers, but, you know, some, you know, significant portion of farming where it's unviable, productivity is low, returns are low. Maybe we should be thinking about providing. And, and you know, and then maybe once you do all this, all these other interventions that we do, maybe we can just kind of roll it all in into this big one. 
and then let you know let agriculture kind of uh, boom uh, in a way that I think it has a, a lot of potential to to happen. So so this is just a, a basic a kind of a big thought uh, I want to leave you with. Now, as I said. The question is, what is going to drive change in agriculture? I, I, say, I said, you know, somehow it has to be made of politics. But I want to end with, I think, two um, things. I think there is no doubt about the fact that in the last two years, the result of the last two years, you know, the general rule that crisis leads to reform and change, which we saw for the economy more generally in 1991, I think it's also been true in this because I do think that this budget and you know this government has spent a lot of time you know uh, thinking about how to support agriculture you know for example in the budget you know the the, the uh, gram sadak yojana allocation was increased we've been very mindful of the fact that we wanted to you know incentivize pulses production and therefore the msp in pulses has, uh, have been increased by significant amounts over the last 2 3 uh, seasons I think the the, the Fasal Bima Yojana, which I said was happening, was also uh, very important. You know, opening up to FDI in agriculture, provided the goods are produced. I think mission mode on, uh, you know, the the, the Krishi Sanchayat Yojana. So I think you know, this in in some ways, crisis has led to a very positive and significant response in terms of addressing agriculture. Obviously, much uh, more remains to be done. Uh, I, I think we need to. Um, you know, but but let's take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, in some ways, you know, uh, supposing we have two good monsoons or good monsoons that Ajay talked about, which of course we all want. Uh, one collateral might be that you know the temporary improvement in the fortunes of agriculture might once again lead to a kind of long-term inattention to agriculture, which we need to be a little bit more watchful about uh, going forward. I, I, I want to end with uh, you know a, a really uh, a, a point which um, you know e economists have no business to be making. Um, you know Robert Solow is a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, uh, he once said that you know when most discussions about economics and economic growth, they begin uh, with a, a great deal of rigor, academic rigor. And end in a blaze of amateur sociology. You know, so so I, I, I'm going to you know end in this uh, uh, blaze of amateur sociology. I think there is one deep problem uh, about agriculture. Why it's maybe not got the attention. I do think that you know, um, you know, the crisis has been, of course focused attention. But I think that you know somewhere along the line, agriculture doesn't resonate as much uh, as it used to. You know, think of. And this is also in terms of the talent that's been attracted to agriculture. You know, um, I, I, I know this is, you know, uh, I, I, if I say things that, uh, you know, sh I shouldn't be, but, you know, in some ways, how do we ma attract the best talent? You know, if you think back, M.S. Swaminathan, you know, C. Subramaniam, you know, the, the great academic economists, um, K. N. Raj, Raj Krishna, in some ways, we don't have those, you know, uh, Burgess Korean, for example, you know, icons. You know, agricultural people were icons, whether in academics or actually as as scientists or farmers or, or politicians. And in some ways, I think something has happened to the sociology of agriculture. I, I think that something has happened along the way. And I think unless we get that back, I think that you know we're going to struggle and struggle because I do think that you know resurrecting farmer livelihoods in India is absolutely must be top priority. Uh, for the country as a whole. Thank you very much. Sir.